we've heard that human violence is on the rise. It's on the wane. It's hardwired. It's learned. Which one is it? Maybe all of them. For centuries, philosophers have debated whether we humans are noble savages, quick to lend a hand and em empathize with a neighbor, or whether we're more like our animal relatives, ready to maim or kill if it improves our lot. What do we really know about human violence? Where it comes from? How to stop it? What can the latest science and years of blood-soaked history tell us about human nature? For this hour, we're going to look at the origins of mankind's most troubling characteristic. Is violence inborn? What role does violent entertainment now play in actual violence? Can understanding where violence comes from help us stop it? My guests today have all had deep thoughts about this. Let me introduce them. Dr. Steven Pinker is professor of psychology at Harvard, author of The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. Welcome back to Science Friday, Stephen. You're welcome. Richard Rangham is professor of biological, biological anthropology at Harvard and co-author of the book Demonic Males, Apes and the Origins of Human Violence. Welcome back to the program, Richard. Thanks. Nice to be here. You're welcome. Uh, Harold Schechter is professor of American literature at Queens College in New York. He's a true crime writer specializing in serial killers and the author of the book Savage Pastimes, A Cultural History of Violent Entertainment. Welcome to Science Friday, Harold. Thank you. Glad to be here. Let's, you're, you're welcome. Let's define some terms. Stephen, let me start with you. How do you define violence? Well, the intentional infliction of harm to another sentient creature, uh, embracing murder, uh, assault, robbery, uh, kidnapping, and rape, whether carried out by individuals or groups. Mm -hmm. If a if a two year old cannot inflict any harm on anybody, is the is he committing any kind of violence? If he well, gets acts it, out and screams and does all those temper tantrums, uh, yeah, I, I would say yes. Uh, we don't have to get caught up on uh, the semantics of the term violence, but clearly psychologically, mm -hmm. he's uh, trying he or she's trying to inflict harm. So sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stephen and Richard, you'll be speaking about violence tomorrow at the ASU Origins Project. Let's get right into this issue. Are humans predisposed to, to, to be violent? Has science answered this question? Let me begin with Richard first. Well, I mean, what you have to acknowledge is that if humans are in an anarchical state where there is no uh, power, uh, whether it's the police or the government or, or a king, stopping people from being violent, then there's no question that there's a tremendous uh, tendency for people to express themselves violently at times. So uh, it's not just that people have to be encouraged to be violent. It, it certainly emerges spontaneously. If you look at hunters and gatherers around the world, those that are in contact with neighboring hunter-gatherer societies of different languages uh, are always found to be so violent with each other that there are, are frequent kills of each other uh, at their borders. So there's no doubt in my mind that violence has a long history in, in humans. It, and the nature and nurture question, do you think it's hardwired, more hardwired than learned? What is rather dramatic about the human patterns uh, in hunter-gatherers is the similarity that they show to chimpanzees. And the reason that's of interest is because chimpanzees and humans clearly differ from the, in the degree of socialization. Humans socialize uh, each other. Uh, chimps certainly don't do so with any kind of um, deliberate intent. And mm -hmm. yet, in both species, what you find is that there is a tendency for uh, males to get into small groups, and if they encounter a stranger from the neighbors, they will deliberately hunt them down and kill them. So that suggests mm -hmm. to me that there is a lot of, of inherent propensity for violence in humans, and that what we see nowadays is a suppression of that. Uh, Stephen Pinker, that's, what you're, that's one of the themes of your book, is that we are less violent today than humans used to be. That's right. And the, the entire question, is violence hardwired or uh, is it, can it be affected by the environment, is the wrong kind of question because the, it, doesn't, it doesn't have an either-or answer. We're not blank slates, but we're not wind-up dolls that are insensitive to our environment and just go walking into walls either. And that's also true of violence. Uh, as Richard pointed out, 
Uh, you can certainly have violence in humans and other species without social encouragement to do so. Uh, on the other hand, we don't just commit violence willy-nilly. We're not like the, the Tasmanian devil that just rips through the countryside, leaving a swath of destruction in our wake, come what may. We assess our environment and uh, can modulate our tendency toward violence, or our tendencies, because violence is not one thing. There are a number of different reasons that people will harm one another. Uh, each one of them is sensitive to the environment in a, in a different way. There's just sheer exploitation, just yeah. harming someone who's an obstacle on the path to something that you want, where there the main impediment is simply whether you have any empathy whatsoever for the inconvenient victims. Then there's uh, dominance, the, the contests in many species, more often among males than females, for in violent confrontations for who cl climbing the pecking order and becoming alpha. There's revenge. When do you think that violence is no long, not just uh, permissible, but mandatory? You shouldn't let someone get away with uh, a sin or an infraction. Each one of these kinds of violence is sensitive to our uh, assessment of our environment in different ways. And yes, our, we have changed our environments to make violence less likely, even though the tendencies are still there. Mm -hmm. Harold Schechter, in your book, Savage Pastimes, you looked at violent entertainment throughout mm -hmm. history. Yes. And, and what did you find? Or, uh, we, well, we, I, I, we would seem to think that with all the violence we have in video games and things, that we are in a very violent entertainment period. Well, uh, popular culture has always been incredibly violent. I mean, part of the um, thesis of my book, which looks very, very closely at the history of mass-produced popular entertainment, um, is that contrary to what many people believe, the popular entertainments of the past were often far more savage and brutal uh, than the violent video games that have come under such assault from moral crusaders nowadays. Um, and in fact, I take the kind of violence you find in Grand Theft Auto and these other shoot 'em up games to actually be a very, very positive sign of our increasing civilization. Um, because in the not too distant past, uh, people derived a great deal of pleasure from going and seeing actual human beings being subjected to torture and execution. You know, one of the examples I use in my book is the movie Braveheart. Uh, at the end of the movie Braveheart, uh, Mel Gibson, playing Willie, the Scottish hero William Wallace, is um, tortured and killed. And in the movie, you really don't get to see anything. You just get to see Mel Gibson sort of strung up in this picturesque way that shows off his musculature at a handsome advantage. Uh, and then the camera cuts away to the actual brutality. When William Wallace, the real historical William Wallace, was executed, uh, it took hours and hours and hours, and he was subjected to the most hideous kinds of atrocities imaginable in front of a large, uh, very appreciative audience. So, uh, you know, I, I take that as a very, very healthy sign. The, the bad news is uh, human beings still require violent entertainment. The good news is we are now willing to settle for it in simulated forms. Do we pay any price? We don't pay any price then? I would say on the contrary. Not only do we pay a price, but we reap many social and personal and psychological rewards. You know, I'm in agreement with uh, both Richard and Stephen. You know, William James spoke of uh, human beings' primordial instinct for bloodshed and cruelty. Um, I feel that we are innately violent creatures um, who have to be socialized. Uh, and that when you find characters like the serial killers I write about, those people are the products of a failure of socialization. Um, and that popular entertainment, the reason popular entertainment is and has always been so violent is, mm -hmm. you know, that it affords uh, a social safety valve for the innately violent fantasies of normal law-abiding people. I think it helps keep society on an even psychological keel. You know, is, Plato is said, uh, let me just, I mean, Pla sure. I think, you know, Plato said, you know, Plato said, the virtuous man is content to dream what the wicked man really does. And I, I believe that uh, popular culture affords, again, law abiding, uh, well brought up uh, people who would never in their real lives commit an act of criminality or violence, uh, a kind of a way to ventilate those repressed impulses. Mm -hmm. Our number can is 844-7... Let me just give out the number, please. And you can, please, I'd love you to jump in. 844-724-8255. Yeah, uh, Harold, jump in. 
Oh, that wasn't me. I'm so, sorry, Richard. Yeah. Uh, Richard, I jumped in. Yeah. This is Richard, and, uh, and I, yeah. I was loving Harold's account of, um, uh, of the role of uh, uh, entertainment violence, as it were. But I noticed uh, a sort of sanitized version in relationship uh, to the sexes or the genders. Hmm. Uh, he was uh, talking about people. And, of course, if we're going to talk about violence, we really have to acknowledge that um, it is men mm -hmm. or boys who are responsible for the great majority of it. Yes, I think so that's I wondered, true. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering about uh, uh, entertainment in history uh, with regard to entertaining oh. men or women. Well, you know, I mean, I think if you uh, historically look at the um, makeup of the audiences for executions and so on, I mean, there were at least as many women as there were men. I and mean, one of the things that's very interesting to me as a writer of historical crime stories is that I every time there has been uh, a very sensational murder, uh, most of the spectators who occupy the seats in the courtroom are women. So there, I, I think there is an attraction among women to violent fantasies as well. Um, I would also say in, in general, y you know, the, the function of pop art again is to allow people to exercise or ventilate mm -hmm. these taboo, socially unacceptable fantasies. And that doesn't have only to do with violence. I mean, if you look at the, a phenomenon like Fifty Shades of Grey, you, know, you see that it also has to do with allowing them to indulge in, you know, very, very forbidden sexual fantasies that they would not permit themselves to enact in life. Uh, 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 Richard, what about the gender in chimp violence? You studied that. What do we? Oh, see it's incredibly there? dramatic. Yeah. Yes, I mean, y you have the opportunity to to follow small groups of chimpanzees as they go on these um, so-called border patrols, where. It's quite clear that their activity is not to do with uh, their regular maintenance. They're not there to feed. They're not there to even to look for food. What they're there to do is to look for opportunities to kill members of neighboring groups or harm them so badly that they die. And um, sometimes you get females joining in these in the sense that they travel with the males. But normally the females drop off before they get to the edge. And uh, even if a female uh, occasionally, one without a child normally, um, is there actually at the time that the males succeed in uh, stalking, uh, hunting, and grabbing a member of the neighboring group, all the males pile in, but she doesn't. She, she mm -hmm. might run around uh, getting excited. So it's mm -hmm. absolutely clear that it is, it is a male phenomenon that is responsible for the typical pattern of um, this extraordinary uh, deliberate uh, imposition of, of harm. Mm -hmm. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Talking with Stephen Pinker, Harold Schechter, uh, Richard Rangham. Um, has the nature of the kind of violence changed? And then let me just throw this, throw this out, and, and not in any political way. And We're willing to accept 40,000 deaths every year by firearms. We're willing to accept an equal 30,000, 40,000 deaths a year by cars. There are tens of thousands of people dying other ways that never died these ways. There were no, the firearms weren't there, the cars weren't there, other diseases or whatever that we could, we might be able to prevent. Is that not violence, you know, that, that is, that is in a change, change way than it used to be? And, and I'm a little, Stephen, uh, if yeah. you measure it that way, is, is violence not on the rise? No, no, it's numbers. definitely not on the rise. Uh, it, in fact, uh, homicide statistics go back hundreds of years in many parts of the world, and whenever you plot them over time, you see mm -hmm. uh, massive declines in any area that's come under the control of a uh, of a state. So in England, for example, the homicide rate now is about 1 35th what it was in the Middle Ages. Even in the United States, uh, the uh, first areas that were settled in any part of the country would have extremely high rates of violence uh, until they were uh, brought under state control, until the frontier w was closed. And you don't need a gun to, to kill people. Uh, we, Since we're a uh, hunting species, anything that we can use to kill an animal, we can use to kill a member of our species. Uh, anyone who has the tools to, cut, to make salad has the tools to stab another person to death. So certainly guns uh, can exacerbate the likelihood of violence, but Human violence is mm -hmm. not primarily about guns. Mm -hmm. What, what and, about and the... Oh, by the way... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and it, by the way, when it even comes to uh, the uh, unintentional 
violence on the highway, the rate of death in um, traffic accidents has fallen by a sixth per passenger mile mm-hmm. since the 1950s. So there seems to be a general increased valuation of human life, which is manifested both in uh, reductions in intentional harm, but also in unintentional harm. We we try to make the world safer so that we trade off other conveniences in order to have a lower chance of uh, of coming to a violent end. Mm-hmm. There was a recent study that showed that in children, when shown violent video games, they seem to become more aggressive after the games. Are you familiar with that study? Yes. So what, what uh, Harold Schechter said about uh, the beneficial uh, uh, effects of violent entertainment is the opposite of the consensus among my fellow psychologists. But I actually think that Harold is right and my fellow psychologists are wrong. Uh, there are uh, There's a huge effort, largely moralistic among psychologists, to stigmatize violent entertainment. I don't think the research is very good at showing that. And in fact, the, uh, the bulk of the research shows that uh, although more violent people might be attracted to more violent entertainment, and if you show kids a Roadrunner cartoon, they may run around a, a little more and, and hit a Bobo doll more often. Mm-hmm. But in terms of affecting violence in real life, uh, I don't think there's good evidence that violent entertainment makes people more violent. Yeah, I mean, one of the points, uh, you know, that I made in the book, one of the reasons I I wrote my book is that I'm a baby boomer. I mean, all I and my contemporaries did was play with guns. Um, I I once The Westerns. The Westerns. And, you know, those were, (laughs) you know. I remember. No, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, talk about gratuitous violence. I mean, every episode of Gunsmoke started with Marshall Dillon pulling out his gun and shooting out some faceless guy. You didn't even know for mm-hmm. what reason. Um, there was this fetishizing of guns. You know, Have Gun Will Travel, which was the number one TV show for several seasons, you know, would begin with a close-up of Paladin's, you know, mm-hmm. custom-made Colt forty five. Um, you Richard know, we're, Boone. We're, yeah. We're, I mean, we're now living in a culture where, uh, you know, first graders can be kicked out of class yeah. because they form their hands into pistols. Um, whereas, again, I and all my contemporaries did nothing but run around shooting each other. And, you know, we did not grow up to be a generation of violent people. So. All right. I have to let me take a break. We'll come back and talk about some more about the history of violence and uh, maybe get some questions in for our listeners. Talking with Stephen Pinker, Harold Schechter, Richard Rangham. And, uh, and you, you can tweet us at Facebook at SciFry if you'd like. We'll be right back after this break. Stay with us. In case you joined us, you're listening to Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. We're talking this hour about violence. And we're talking with Stephen Pinker, professor of psychology at Harvard, Richard Rangham, professor of biological anthropology at Harvard, and Harold Schechter, a true crime author and professor of American literature at Queens College in New York. Let me get a, a phone call in here because it's, uh, it's uh, kind of interesting if I can uh, figure out where to <laughs> press the button on this one. Um, Let's go to, uh, is it Cass in Baton Rouge? Uh, yeah, Cass. Yes. Hi, right, go ahead. All right, yeah, I was just, um, I heard him talking about the Grand Theft Auto video game and how that might um, help people vent by playing these violent video games. And um, it just made me think about professional wrestling. Um, would that, do you think that would help um, people? How does that fit in? You know, it's people watching these performers that are obviously, it's not real. It's fake violence, but a lot of people go to these shows and a lot of people watch it on TV every week. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you think professional wrestling fits in at all? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I just think there's this vast human appetite for violent spectacle. And you have to ask yourself why so much, not only of uh, popular entertainment, but great art, you know, is so rife with violence. You know, what exactly is that appealing to um, in the audience? And, uh, you know, again, from my point of view, and, and I think again, from what Stephen and and Richard have been insisting on, you know, is that we are, uh, on some level, um, creatures born of violence. Um, You know, Robert Ardrey, this one critic uh, who wrote a very influential book called African Genesis, says, "We, we weren't born of fallen angels, we were born of risen apes. And those apes were armed killers besides, and that's still part of our makeup. And, you know, in order to satisfy that carnivore within, to use another phrase of Henry James, you know, we turn to all of these um, spectacles, whether it's wrestling or video mm-hmm. games or, for that matter, Shakespeare's King Lear uh, as a way of uh, ventilating some of these uh, impulses that we deny in ourselves. So we need a sort of an outlet exactly. to play these games. We need an outlet. We need some way to act these things out without hurting people by going to wrestling, watching it, knowing it's fake. 
Absolutely. Yes, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. And an interesting development in violent entertainment is that as it is more gruesome and bloody on the surface, it's actually safer and safer in terms of uh, of actual harm done. So you can go to the cinemaplex and watch this you know, splatter fest of, of uh, gore and violence and pain and torture, and at the end of the movie it says no animals were harmed in the making of this motion picture. Right. Or even in... in um, uh, 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 simulated fights or real fights in, in um, mixed martial arts and wrestling. It looks pretty awful, but as those have been increasing in popularity, boxing has decreased, and the object of boxing is basically to give the other guy brain damage. Uh, boxing is much more destructive than the pretty superficial flesh wounds that you might get in mixed martial arts. And so I, th- uh, mm-hmm. I think that as we get better at de- depicting uh, gruesome violence, we're simultaneously reducing real violence. Richard Rangham, you, you agree with this? Uh, yes, no, that all sounds fine. But um, again, I'm interested in the sex differences. Um, y- you know, uh, uh, Harold was saying that, that women are really interested in um, the depiction of violence. And that's, that's a fascinating observation. I wonder about the extent to which their behavior is affected by it. Uh, Steve thinks that there isn't going to be much effect on either sex. Um, but uh, I am aware of studies which show that Um, actually chimpanzees watching violence uh, or uh, babies watching violence are more likely to be violent if they're male after being exposed uh, to depictions of violence or actual violence um, uh, as whereas females may be interested but uh, don't change Mm -hmm. their behavior I'm not sure how um, how well that is stands up as a generalization but uh, it would seem to me that we have to come back to the notion that it is Males who are predisposed by their evolutionary background uh, to take advantage of opportunities to be violent. Mm-hmm. What's what's that? What's that famous phrase? Uh, All the world's troubles can be traced back to the inability of men to sit quietly in a room. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Pretty much any quantitative measure of violence will show a uh, sex difference uh, with, with males the more violent sex. Men fantasize more about violence, they consume more violent entertainment, they commit more violence, although in none of the cases is the rate of violence for women zero. Uh, so women certainly can be violent. They're less likely to be. And I suspect that if you were to subdivide violence into different psychological kinds, and, and uh, I believe that, that violence is not a single category, that there would be different kinds that men and women would engage mm. in. Uh, when it comes to just sheer instrumental violence, just you, you need to... Uh, mm-hmm. um, get rid of something to increase your own safety or the safety of your family or you uh, you want something and there's a, a nuisance, I don't think the sex difference would be as large as uh, pure contests over dominance, They well, what I genteely call competitive distance urination, uh, where the gender with the apparatus that allows them to compete is the gender that is more likely to uh, get involved in such contests. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I just want to uh, toss in here. Um, you know, I write books about serial killers, and um, uh, the question of whether there are female serial killers uh, is, you know, one that is of much interest to people in my field. Uh, Camille Paglia says there are no female Jack the Rippers, which is true. Uh, that kind of very aggressive phallic sexual mutilation murder is strictly a male phenomenon. But there have been many, many, many women who commit sadistic, kinds of serial killing. They just do it in different ways. They, they tend to be poisoners, for example. Black Widow. Uh, black, what Black Widow is. And, and it's interesting. They also tend to mostly uh, prey on um, uh, acquaintances and intimates and family members as opposed to going around and trolling for strangers the way a lot of male serial killers do. So there, there certainly seems to be a, a capacity for sadistic behavior uh, among women. Um, and as I said, I mean, there are many, many, many cases of female serial poisoners, some of whom have killed many more people than male serial killers. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I think it's rather wonderful. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, I was just going to say that I think it's rather wonderful that we're in an, a time uh, in our history when we can afford to really focus on uh, those rare individuals. You know, the... Mm-hmm. Uh, well, those that we might think of as, as psychopaths or pathological in some ways, the serial killers. Because if we go back into uh, not too long ago, uh, basically everybody was violent. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you think about um, uh, life in hunter gatherers only ten thousand years ago, then uh, there weren't any men who systematically said, you know, uh, I'm a peace-loving guy. 
uh, they would all go on the raids. They would all be involved in, in killing each other. And, and now we're at this wonderful moment in history where uh, we expect each other to be nonviolent. Mm -hmm. And it's the rare cases that uh, uh, are violent. Mm -hmm. Let me go to the phones to, to Alan on Long Island. Hi, welcome to Science Friday. Hi, how you doing? Yeah, you may have already answered my question when you started talking about sports, because I always, I kind of see, um, I kind of think of competition as being kind of integral to the, to the uh, conversation. I mean, when I think about early men, you know, they competed for food uh, with each other, uh, with other animals. Uh, they people competed for for mates. So, you know, the, just the high degree, I'd like you guys, if me, maybe you'd like to comment on, on the role of competition um, mm. in, yeah, thanks for in yeah. terms of violence. Well, w one of the dramatic things, I think, about uh, the commonalities between uh, chimpanzees and hunter-gatherers living in a world of hunter-gatherers is that you actually don't need any immediate source of competition to precipitate the violence. What you want is a sufficient power difference that one group is able to kill members of a neighboring group without any risk of themselves being harmed. In other words, I suppose that we're in a group of, um, uh, of hunters and gatherers, or it could be chimpanzees, and life is good for us, and, and we can afford to go and spend time checking our boundaries, then uh, all we need to do is to just see a member of the neighboring group in order to be able to have the satisfaction of killing them. So mm -hmm. it's not that they're fighting over a female or over a food resource. Very often what they're doing is simply taking advantage of their power. That's the kind of horrendous background you've got to think of uh, in terms of the propensity for violence. And there's a, a famous experiment that every psychology undergraduate is exposed to called the Robbers Cave Study, in which two groups of mentally healthy 11-year-old boys were uh, sent off to camp, and uh, the counselors, who are really graduate students in psychology, wanted to uh, look at their forms of violent competition, and they found that before they even had them competing over any resource, before they'd even met each other, they just heard each other in the distance, they were itching to compete. There was nothing to compete over, but just the presence of another group of boys mm. was enough to get their juices mm. flowing. Speaking yeah, of getting juices flowing, uh, Harold Schechter, in your new book, The Mad Sculptor, mm -hmm. you describe violent stories that grab our attention. Could can I get yeah. you to read a passage uh, for us? Well, uh, one of the early chapters uh, begins, uh, to become a true tabloid sensation, a murder has to offer more than morbid titillation. It needs a pair of outsized characters, diabolical villain and defenseless, preferably female victim, a dramatic storyline, and the kind of lurid goings-on that speak to the secret dreams and dangerous desires of the public. Um, and. You know, I go on to talk about this one mm -hmm. tabloid case that gripped the country as opposed to the dozens of other equally lurid murders that were going on at the time. Um, <clears throat> but again, this kind of relates to, to the last caller. I mean, for, to me, one of the inspiring thing, uh, things about our species, you know, is that we have learned to transform these very, very savage primitive impulses into kinds of games. Uh, into stories. Uh, obviously, you know, talking about sports, something like football, you know, is all a game, a game about territorial aggression and so on and so forth. Um, you know, but again, we turn these things into pastimes, into forms of make-believe. We sublimate them uh, into socially acceptable and even socially beneficial kind of activities. So, I mean, I'm a, a glasses, a half full kind of yeah. guy, yeah. Um, but I see all of the violence in the culture that surrounds us. I mean, the make-believe violence is actually a very, very positive sign of this civilizing process. Mm. Do you, do, what about people who say that the make-believe violence, uh, just like you were describing, uh, we were describing the murders that happened before, mm -hmm. are not gory enough as they are in real life? And if people really saw the kind of real kinds of violence, what the blood, the gore, whatever that really happens, they might think twice about being as violent. Or is there any research that shows that? Oh, um, well, I don't ask yeah. anybody. You <laughs> well, <know. laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, one of the things, again, I think if you, you know, for all the talk about realistic violence in the media, I mean, it's very, very stylized. It's nothing like real violence. You know, sometimes I one time, I once in my life was on a city bus in New York City. 
and saw uh, the police uh, shoot a guy, um, and the guy just collapsed. <laughs> you know, he just fell right. down. I mean, right. he wasn't doing this balletic slow motion bloodbath right. kind of thing. Um, yes. So, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can't watch uh, documentaries about women giving birth. Um, you know, <laughs> right, you know, see all these, uh, you know, I'm a big Walking Dead fan or whatever, but mm. so, yeah, there isn't a, 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 a much of a correlation between those two things. Yes, I, I mean, remind I, everybody, I Stephen, but let me just jump in and say, uh, mm -hmm. I'm Ira Plato, and this is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Yes, most bill. real Stephen, life. go ahead. Most real life uh, episodes of, of uh, violence are, are nothing like the uh, the roaring fisticuffs in in uh, you know Deadwood Gulch. Uh, but the way I described it, it's more like a, a two minute penalty for roughing in a boring hockey game, mm -hmm. where two men will kind of clutch and grab, fall to the floor. Maybe a, a fist will emerge from right. a mutual embrace. Uh, it's all actually quite boring. Uh, when there when there are dramatic scenes of uh, real life violence that are interpreted as real life violence, uh, they can be effective. And it's not implausible to think that some of the uh, anti war uh, sentiments that have arisen over the last half century were, uh, were facilitated by the fact that wars are, are televised. Uh, mm -hmm. World War I, the uh, British government censored battlefield photographs because they were probably quite rightly uh, concerned that if people saw what was happening on the battlefield, it would dash their image of glorious combat and turn them against the conduct of the war. Vietnam was the first televised war, and some of the unforgettable images, like the uh, the naked girl running from the napalm mm -hmm. attack or the Viet Cong um, soldier shot in cold blood by a, um, a police officer, uh, probably did have a role in turning many Americans away from the war, and we're seeing that even more now when every person is a reporter, anyone with a smartphone can beam mm -hmm. footage to the web in almost in real time. We're concerned about violence in places of the world that we didn't really care about uh, several decades ago. Uh, but I think a lot depends on how it's framed. It's not just that if you see blood, if you see fisticuffs, uh, that automatically makes you more or less violent. Uh, we interpret what we see. We uh, think about the real world events in which they did or didn't take place, and that's really what governs our reaction mm -hmm. to violence. If if we grow up with violence in our home, does that affect how whom whom we become? Uh, a lot of things tend to go together. Uh, if you grow up with violence in the home, uh, unless you're adopted, you have also uh, inherited the genes of the people committing that violence, so it isn't so easy to tease apart nature and nurture in those cases. Uh, you're also likely to grow up in a violent neighborhood, and uh, your fate uh, among your peers and your interests on the street are going to depend on your willingness to uh, carry out violence. So a lot of things tend to go together. I suspect that the uh, 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 peer environment in the neighborhood is a more potent factor than uh, what your parents did once you subtract the genetic contribution. So it is environmental. It's not necessarily parental. Mm -hmm. By so the way, thinking about the, the, um, the way that violence is portrayed in the media, we've been talking about it's, um, it's more gory or, or, or different uh, from the way that it occurs in, in uh, representations in the public. But uh, there's also another way in which it differs, and that is that the style of violence that is often portrayed is two sides coming together and willingly grappling with each other, either as individuals at the, at the end of the movie or um, in battles. You know, there's the Braveheart scene where uh, two sides are, are, are roaring towards each other, uh, full of enthusiasm to get into the fight. That is completely unrealistic. The way that um, violence tends to happen is by people avoiding direct confrontation and waiting until they can uh, commit the the uh, violence uh, from a safe perspective. And in fact, there was a wonderful study uh, over 100 years ago of um, what happens when armies are uh, sent towards each other. And very often, they just slide past each other and don't, and don't uh, hit each other mm. at all. Or um, they stop before they can get within uh, the range of their weapons. So right. you know, people are much less willing to engage in violence than the media uh, represent. Yeah, right, we're have to wait, wait, we violence. have to leave. We have to leave it at there. I'll let you guys discuss it more at uh, Arizona State University. Stephen Pinker, professor of psychology at Harvard. Richard Rangham, professor of biological anthropology at Harvard. Harold Schechter, true crime author, professor of American literature at Queens College. Thank you all for joining us today.